here. And this again is a camera. And it looks at a, a piece of film that's here and another piece of film that's here. And that's a lamp. And again, you re-photograph the, uh, uh, you photograph uh, one piece of film and then you rewind the camera and you do a double exposure and you rewind the camera and you keep doing that endlessly to create this kind of picture. So in that picture like this, this background was uh, three pieces of film, a red, green, blue separation. These, each spaceship took seven pieces of film, so you got three, 14, and the engines were one piece of film each, 15, 16 pieces of film, little separate pieces of film. The 1989 Academy Award winning picture, The Abyss, required all the visual effects tricks known to create an environment seemingly without effects. The effects teams combined radically different environments, water and air, to create the illusion of a futuristic adventure 2,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. Jim had done a, a film, his very first attempt at uh, shooting underwater. He said that uh, basically sets that were left underwater overnight were destroyed by the following morning. So it was determined very early on uh, that we would shoot uh, in some sort of tank. During the filming of the live action sequences, divers were submerged six to seven hours a day in underwater sets. Scenes too complicated to shoot underwater were filmed in miniature on dry stages. Jim Cameron, who basically did most of the boarding, you know, along with John Bruno uh, for quite some time, came to DreamQuest along with other effects facilities uh, with the idea of breaking down the shots into specific categories or areas. And he came to DreamQuest with most of the uh, motion control type work. Boards were already complete, as you can probably see some of we have up here. Essentially, what he wanted to do was find out our technique and ideas of how we would go about accomplishing the shots. So it did some thinking and uh, came up with some suggestions or ideas of new techniques that might allow the effects to look more realistic than probably could have been done with standard technology. And action, John. The director and effects teams built foam core mock-ups of the models and underwater sets to carefully choreograph and plan each scene as it would appear in the final film. Using videotape and stills of a cargo shipwreck 800 feet underwater as reference material, they returned to the stage to match the look of the abyss as closely as possible to reality. Okay, coming to the stop point. Now keep going, keep going. Okay. That's just a, to create a relationship. FX uh, 57 uh, is a shot where uh, Lindsay and the crew, the group, who are in the submersibles begin the reconnaissance and trying to find a sunken submarine. Basically, what it is, is a shot of, of three small submersibles going along the hull from the stern of the sub all the way to the bow of the broken nose of, of, of the sub. And again, it's being intercut with live action real footage of submersibles that they did in South Carolina in the big tank. What we did is we used the gantry um, system, the gantry motion control system, to hang the submersibles and then shot it using about six passes, some shot in smoke, some shot in clean air, and through the combination of the passes, filtration, and lighting, we were able to give the feeling that uh, we were shooting actually underwater. Most of the time, uh, when you're doing motion control work, you have separate film elements. In this case, having the actual models working in the same room, in the same environment, it allowed the lights from the submersibles, which were really the, were the only light source in the scene, to actually illuminate the background, which in this case was the sunken uh, Montana. When we started the abyss, we looked at using traditional techniques. In other words, shooting the subs against uh, a blue screen and compositing them into a background, in this case a Trident submarine. The advantage the gantry system gave us was that we were able to do everything pretty much in camera. We, we spent the extra time to build this enormous rig and it took much longer to program because instead of maybe uh, 8 or 12 axes of movement, suddenly we had 32 going all at once, all three submarines and uh, in addition to the camera moves and any other little uh, gags we had going on at the time. The models on the particular part of the gantry were kind of special in the sense that they had to be self-contained. In other words, the submersibles had to have their own power sources, they had to contain the rear projectors, and they were quite large. 
Dave Goldberg was in charge of actually designing and coming up with a lot of solutions in constructing the models. A rear projection system was used within the submersibles to give the illusion of the actor actually being inside the craft piloting it. The film was shot of the actors in a full-size set prior to our shooting the miniatures and then used in a projector that was built and put inside the models. The finished illusion would be that even though you were looking at a miniature, you would be seeing live action people inside of it. The scenes are shot in separate passes in order to control exposure and color of each element. Using the technology of motion control, the effects teams duplicate the movements of each model perfectly for the final composite. The light from the miniature subs in smoke makes up one pass. Another pass in clean air uses fill light in order to see the details of the models. The image of Lindsay is rear projected into the cockpit of the miniatures in a separate pass. The final composite is made up of these and other elements, including a pass for strobe lights and bubbles, which add to the underwater look of the scene. The sequence is where Lindsay's outside of the, the broken, damaged deep core, and she's on literally on the edge of the abyss standing there, and she senses this colorful light, and this huge type of ship, kind of glass ship comes up. And so it's made up of a number of cuts. And the first one is, of course, is a wide angle shot where we see Lindsay and some of the wreckage in the edge of the abyss as we see the med ship rise up and over the edge. That was done dry for wet. In other words, Lindsay, who was actually a stunt person shot uh, months later uh, at Harbor Star in San Pedro, was shot against a blue screen uh, in air. We then cut to a close up where we're down low looking up as the manta wing kind of passes over top and she reaches up and actually touches the surface. This one we're close enough that the bubbles and her regulator and just the whole way that the uh, water moves and the bubbles come off the top of the Manta ship required us to shoot it underwater. In order to give the illusion that her bubbles were coming in, in contact with the surface of the Manta ship, what we did is we hung plexiglass mirrors in the water at the plane of which the wing would actually coincide. These are the finished boards of the pseudopod sequence, which were the scenes exactly as we would have liked to see them. Looking these over, you know, we sat down one day and said, well, they can't be done. Uh, not by any means that, that I know of or other than computer graphics, but we were really nervous about CGI basically because at that time, CGI still, it still looked plastic. The first photorealistic computer-generated graphics were produced by ILM for the film Young Sherlock Holmes. A computer created a stained glass night not possible with any other effects technique. For the abyss, CGI would need to be pushed beyond its known limits. Here we were asking it to do water. So we talked about all these other ways. One was replacement animation of acrylic pieces. But the, with the, the length of the shots required, we thought that would be insane. At this point, Dennis Muren of Industrial Light and Magic suggested Alias Research Computer Animation System to produce the pseudopod. Those tests showed uh, some possibilities, but initially it looked a little chrome and still a little plastic, but it looked like it was possible at least to get all the motion that we needed. And then we figured if it didn't work, which, which a lot of us were not really positive, that we would just cut the sequence shorter or we would light it dark. The scene required an alien probe made of seawater to float in mid-air as it encounters a crew of humans. The effect was so difficult that it could not have been done by any other means than computer-generated imaging. The evolution of digital technology has provided filmmakers with the opportunity to attempt projects never before possible. To have contemporary pop star Paula Abdul perform with legendary dancer Gene Kelly would have been impossible without computers. 
The challenge for our Greenberg and Associates was to provide an interaction between the two dancers and match the original camera moves. We've gone to great lengths to figure out the uh, lens information that was used on the old um, footage and things like that so that we can match things as, as closely as possible. The intention is to create seamless choreography between the 40s and the 90s. For lighting and shadowing, reference material was filmed using a stand-in for Gene Kelly to help determine where the shadows should fall and move. The first step is to isolate and pull Gene Kelly's image from the original background. A mat or cutout is created and tested for fit. Gene is then placed into the scene with Paula. Adjustments are made in color, movement and lighting. Once completed, the elements are combined into the finished piece. The thought of dancing with Gene Kelly and Groucho and being able to be in the scene with Cary Grant. Who, who wouldn't love to be in a situation like that? These are heroes of mine. Record and music. With this commercial, everything is a matter of seconds and I have to hit certain marks, like tape marks, because of the motion control camera or, or because of the icons I don't want to cross over. and You have to work everything out. There's just one, and there's no mistake in it, one. Just no fake in it, one. Why don't you and me do some fancy stuff in the night? Oh, we've got two. Ooh, we'll start with it, ooh. Just for feeling. For Terminator 2, visionary director James Cameron and industrial light and magic again push the boundaries of special effects with the creation of the advanced shape-shifting T-1000. The T-1000 was a liquid metal killing machine with the ability to change its form. A computerized morphing technique was employed to digitally transform the T-1000 in a single uninterrupted shot. A live action shot of the actor was digitized and a computer model was split open digitally. Then the software program automatically closed up the severed facial features. The next breakthrough in CGI came in the creation of the living creatures of Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park. First, the background plate for the computer-generated T-Rex was shot on a set. The dinosaur was introduced into the scene and animated in wireframe form. The background plate was scanned into the computer and composited with the wireframe model. The fully rendered T-Rex was a collaboration between special effects, artistry, and science. Cinesite Digital Film Center is creating all of the digital imaging for Lawnmower Man 2. Cinesight and Allied Entertainment are producing these ambitious cyberspace sequences using computer graphic animation blended with live action to create images that exist only in the filmmaker's imagination. Digital effects is using computer software or computer hardware to create or manipulate images that already exist. Let's take uh, maybe a script that takes place in the 1920s or the 1930s, okay? And you really want to recreate Times Square in New York. It's very costly to do that now, but you, there is so much historical footage of Times Square in the 1930s that you could take that footage, you can clean it up, colorize it, contemporize it, and put it into your film. So when you have scripts now that are talking about, uh, you know, faraway lands, or locations that you can't go to or might not exist, or characters that can't be fabricated by any other means, you can put them all together and create them in a computer using digital technology. So really, 
there are no boundaries anymore. Digital technologies, originally developed for industrial use, are being introduced into the entertainment industry. Viewpoint Data Labs produces a three-dimensional catalog of digital models. The human form is always the very best. Uh, to take a picture of you would, would be ideal. And this technology is basically only, only going to be used when either the person is dead or when the person, you know, something unusual needs to happen. It's always been very difficult to try, and, to try and digitize the human face. And so this is one way, using lasers and mirrors, that that, that can be achieved. So we foresee the, uh, the cyberware as just playing a, a companion role. And as, more, as technology becomes greater and more and more stars uh, want to spend less and less time in front of the screen, or they, the creative minds come up with new things for actors to do. Um, that can't be done with traditionally. An actor can't blow his own head up, but we'll be able to do that with the data that's, that's, uh, that's provided by this machine. Everyone's so excited about the technology, which is great, you know, but it's really uh, an after effect of our, our primary goals, which is doing uh, good, good entertainment. I mean, that's, that's what's really going to sell, and, and uh, we're trying to do it digitally. We're trying to do digital cartoons and digital movies. We're able to take a, an actor with all his talents, his or her talents, of uh, portraying dramatic scenarios and record their motion very succinctly into the computer, in fact, at 100 frames per second. As you can see, there's sensors all over the body here um, that are being read vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a, a large magnetic uh, a standing wave that's being created by a magnet under the floor. And the sensors are strategically placed on points in the body that uh, are joint, basically joint points um, for uh, mechanical relationships of body motion. You have complete uh, articulation in the fingers. There's 22 sensors that are being read in real time as well. And um, that goes back into a, a, a normal PC at this point and then uh, gets networked into a silicon graphics machine which will display it in real time. Then at that point, you really, the, the world is wide open. You can superimpose any database you want. It could be a, a cartoon character or a very realistic character, you know, Donald Duck or the skeleton, which is what we did. Digital Domain, a full-service effects studio, was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects for the film True Lies. For Ron Howard's Apollo 13, Digital Domain combined large-scale miniatures, CGI, and live-action photography to achieve photorealistic effects using state-of-the-art digital technology. It's very exciting because I think it's, it's very liberating as a as a director, um, you can shoot uh, you can shoot part of a scene. You can augment it later. You can change your mind and rework it. Almost in a way, you're able to edit within the image, within the shot. For the first time, you can edit within a shot, and that's never been possible before. I mean, the issue of whether we'll see Arnold Schwarzenegger starring in movies 500 years from now, I think very possibly. You know, I mean, I think that it would be possible say within the next 10 years, to, to store his image and his voice in, in three-dimensional data and to, to animate it later. Yeah, he, he may still be around a thousand years from now. Even the best special effect is only as good as the actor's reaction to it. So if you have a, a really great effect and, an, and, a, and, a, and a, you cut to an actor who doesn't look like he's believing what he sees, then your effect is no good. When you create reality, they call it special effects. And it's not an effect, really. When you get through, it's reality. If you don't think it's reality, it's not a good job. I think that uh, visual effect will continue to expand and uh, as long as they continue to satisfy the audience's desire to be put in a place they couldn't otherwise possibly be put, they will continue to be successful. Mm -hmm.